Yeah, so uh, good morning everyone. Uh, today's uh, tutorial speaker uh, with us, what we have, uh, we have uh, Daniel, who is faculty member at University of Artwa. He has been working in this field for more than 20 years now. His PhD was also in this domain and he is passionate about applying the techniques for constraint solving and optimization to solve industrial problem. He is well known as an author of SAT4J, one of the most impactful solvers uh, that is used in the industry. He is also the editor of Journal of Satisfiability, a Boolean Modeling and Computation. So yeah, without further ado, I uh, will request Daniel to take over. Thank you for the kind introduction. So thank you for the organizer for inviting me to the TET SMT school. Uh, this is my first time in India and this is, uh, it has been very nice uh, to now. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce you. So we would have three slots uh, in the SAT SMT school. So this morning it will be sort of theoretical and uh, this afternoon we will play a bit with, uh, with the solvers and we will see what it means uh, to model problems and uh, and you will see that SAT or uh, Pseudomolean or MaxSAT, these are just like assembly language for modeling problems. So they are not really useful per se uh, by the end user. You need to have uh, another layer on top of it. But uh, still, we were just to give you an idea of uh, what's uh, going on. So um, I will try to uh, show you uh, an example. Uh, so. Is it possible to sit M researchers on M minus one seats? So you see that here there are much more seats than we have researchers, there, there's no problem. But, and it looks uh, quite stupid, like uh, an theoretical question. What do we care about that problem, right? What, what, are, what it has to do with uh, real applications? Well, uh, suppose you want to optimize the number of seats, okay? What you are going to, so it's obvious for us because uh, the number of researchers on this is completely related, but in a big uh, problem, industrial problem, uh, some variables might be, doesn't seem related at all at the first glance in the problem, but for the survey, it doesn't matter. What you ask is, give me a solution that it will give you a solution with M researchers on M seats, and then you will have to prove, to prove that it's optimal, that it's not possible to assign M researcher to M minus one seats, okay? So and we heard on during the first day that optimization problems are the real problems uh, in the industry, in the world. And this is exactly why if you cannot solve that very simple problem, you are not going to solve optimization problems with a SAT solver, okay? And so what does it mean exactly when we, uh, when we want to solve that problem? It means that at least each researcher should have uh, a seat, and each seat cannot host more than one researcher. And those are actually uh, constraints that we have seen yesterday with MATE. Those are cardinality constraints. Okay. So how do you uh, represent the first one? The first one you could just use uh, a specific of cardinality constraints where the threshold is one, which means that it's just a close, a simple close that we, we have seen uh, during uh, the two previous days. And then you have the fact that each seat cannot host more than one researcher. If you, have, uh, if you only have clauses, you probably will uh, replace that by another constraint saying it's not possible to have two persons on the same seat. Okay? And this is exactly what it means here. I cannot have both. Uh, uh, so here X uh, denotes that uh, we have the researcher I is on the set seat J, and we cannot have two different researchers on the same seat, okay? So this is a, the classical way to uh, express uh, a cad uh, at most one, but suppose you have 10,000, 1 million variables. This is N square. It won't work, okay? So th there are ways to uh, do that uh, better than uh, this uh, textbook's approach. Um, and typically, the funny thing is, you can take cryptoministat, whatever solver, or no, not cryptoministat, not lingering, because they have specific processing for that. But if you take the best SAT solver without tricks for counting, it will not be able to answer for M greater than 20. And that looks quite stupid, right? But this is the state of the art. The, the theory tells us you cannot ask a SAT solver to count. It doesn't work. 
So uh, what we can do then, you have another class of uh, solvers that has been designed in the years. So those are pseudo-blend constraint solvers. In that case, you are allowed to use the slightly more powerful uh, constraint. So you, we keep the first one, okay? Uh, so this is just a way to rewrite uh, the clause, okay? We just tell the sum. So here, uh, instead of true false, we have zero, one. We are going to sum the Boolean values, and we, we just know that at least one of these guys should be one, and which is the clause, and so it just means the sum should be, should be greater than one. And uh, here, we, what we have is uh, we can, uh, each seed cannot host more than a researcher, and uh, it means simply that we are going to express directly with this pseudomonant uh, constraint uh, the fact that we can, the sum of, the, of all the assigned value uh, given a j uh, is less or equal to one. And this is one constraint before we add uh, n square. And if you, if you use uh, a solver that is based on resolution, so it can be two things, it can be you have a representation uh, internal representation of the constraints that are clearly uh, pseudo boolean constraints or cardinality constraints, but you do not change the conflict analysis procedure, it won't, find, it won't be able to do better much than uh, a classical SAT solver. Okay? However, if you use another proof system, typically the one you will find in ILP solvers, then you will be able to prove immediately that it doesn't work. Okay? And why can we, and I mean, immediately, at some point, you just have to read the problem, and uh, so you, you, until you are able to generate the problem, uh, the solver will be able to do it. So do you have an idea how to, how to do this? So I added the constraints here, so I have, so this is for m equals three, so we have uh, the researchers, three researchers, two seats, and uh, so here we, we know that each researcher should be on one seat, and here for each seat, you cannot have more than one researcher, okay? So if we want to find that this is not possible using uh, the cutting proof system, what you have to do first is sort of normalize all the constraints so that they are all greater or equal to something. And to do this, we are going to replace, here we have x bar equals one minus x. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that we add uh, uh, x11 and we replace that by one minus x bar 11 and we move the one here, okay? Uh, so what do, and uh, we, we just negated also. So at the end, what we got is this formula. Typically, we replace uh, the literal by the negation and here we do the number of literals minus the former uh, threshold. So it was one, three minus one, here we have two. So we, we get those two cardinality constraints. All right. We will see all this uh, afterwards. Um, so now that we have those three clauses and those two cardinality constraints, do you have one idea how you can proceed? So you need to find something similar to resolution. So you need to add constraints that have uh, opposite literals. So we can see that here we have those three clauses, and here we have opposite literals, okay? We, we, we can add them. So what we're going to do, we're going to add one, two, three, and four, okay? So what does it, what, what is the consequence of that? We are going to, so those opposite literals are going to disappear, okay? And we will keep only those three literals here. So those are the three literals that we have here. Each time we, uh, uh, one pair of literals uh, disappear, it will be one, okay? So we have three in that, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, and we have to sum up the three here plus the two, which is five. So we have three here, five. We move the three here, we get the two. So it means we have a new cardinality constraint, okay? And now if you sum up this one and this one, what we are going to get is to have three greater than four. Why? 
because here we sum up those three elements with those one, so I tell you that it gives you three, because you eliminate three elements. And here we add two on four, and three greater than four, this is not possible, so this is a proof with the cutting per line proof system. Okay? So this, yes? So x11 bar is like minus x11. No, 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 it's one minus. So the, this is the tricky in uh, pseudo constraints. constraint. Uh, you, if you, you have x equals one minus x bar. So if you have x plus x bar, it gives you one that you have to remove from the threshold at the end. So here, when, when, I, uh, when I add uh, those three and that one, e each time I will be clashing here I will, I will replace each of these elements by one, so it means I will, okay. So typically what I have is, Okay, the first step, I can do it. Uh, what do we have with one plus four? We are going to clash those ones, okay? So it will be. So this will be one, which is quite strange, okay? You have to be used to, but, so you replace each time by one, and this one cancels that one. And at the end, and you do that for each, uh, typically each time you add a clause that is conflicting, it just remove the one you have here. So you keep the same, uh, the same threshold. And so this is how you can prove for once for all that it's not possible, okay? And there is no backtrack if you do the right things, okay? Um, so this is, uh, that looks nice. Uh, and so typically this is why we're interested in that kind of uh, more expressive things. The problem is you have theory and practice, okay? So, uh, in practice, what people want, if you do, uh, I'm coming from also constraint programming, where we, you have a very sophisticated uh, constraints, and you have an algorithm dedicated to propagate uh, those constraints. And uh, so, the idea is, you should express your problem with the highest possible uh, level to uh, keep the structure, to provide the more info, the, as much information as possible, and then you use that uh, high-level description to try to solve your problem with whatever tool you want. Uh, this is the idea. Um, so if you are not aware, if I show you uh, the model, this model, which is uh, very similar to, to the mathematical notation, it looks easy to understand. If, you, if I show you that one, it's unlikely that from the beginning you spot that this will give you a less or equal to one, okay? Unless you know what is the, uh, uh, that constraint, okay? So you have a one-to-one -one relationship between your problems and uh, your model if you use uh, uh, higher level constraints, which is important. So we have seen that we have much less uh, constraints if you use uh, the right uh, uh, thing, and this is important for kinetic constraints. Sometimes it will just blow up one million uh, literals, this is possible uh, in a cadenity constraint, you cannot afford to have n square. Um, and so the, the thing is, you, you would like to be able to uh, use uh, do, those constraints. The problem is, uh, typically, if you discuss with people from theoretical computer science, they tell you, well, your system has to work on CNF. Why? Because if you want to compare proof systems, you have to have exactly the same input for both. 
Okay? So it means if you cannot have something that works as uh, also well on CNF, uh, then uh, it's not a good proof system. And uh, that had been uh, something that is uh, typically, that is a bit uh, problematic. And especially because in real life, if you want to encode uh, efficiently those huge kinetic constraints, you are going to add variables. Okay? This is something if you are not used to, if you look at the textbooks, uh, if you look at the textbook, they do not tell you, well, you should add many variables. Why? Because the, the search space is supposed to be two to the power of the number of variables. And so if you add, you know, uh, what I do in SAT4J, I, I add, in many cases, one new variable per clause, per constraints, okay? Which means millions. Which looks, uh, how would you add millions of variables while the search space is two to the power of the number of variables? It doesn't matter because these are not exact. So Mate told you it's the complexity of the problem is not necessarily on the number of variables because if you have variables that only appear at one place, they are not. Uh, it's not the same thing as if you have uh, the original variables who are embedded in the whole problem. Okay. Um, and then what it means? It means that uh, if you look at the proof from uh, theoretical computer science, then there is a way but a very specific way to retrieve uh, the Kalanity constraint from the CNF. And I want to show you that because uh, this is something um, uh, you want to uh, understand, to understand why it's complicated also to design solvers because we, it, if something exists, if you are able to do it uh, by hand, it doesn't mean you are going to uh, uh, write exactly that as an algorithm for a solver because you, you may not want to, you want to be generic and this is uh, very specific. So how do you retrieve cardinality constraints uh, using uh, from clauses? So typically you start with binary clauses and so that binary clauses is exactly that uh, cardinality constraint, okay? We, because we keep the literals uh, this is just uh, another way to represent the same thing, but uh, it's uh, more convenient because we will put coefficients, so I prefer to have overline. So this is just a notation trick. And so th the threshold is I should have at least one of those two guys satisfied. This is just a close. And so what you want to do then, you want to sum them up for a specific seat J, and then you are going to obtain something like this uh, with those coefficients, then you want to divide it by two, so you will remove those coefficients become one, and this one will be rounded up to uh, three divided by uh, two will be will give you two, because that will be the nearest integer. And you are going to repeat that for each uh, constraint that you are going to produce. Here is an example. You start with uh, so this is for three persons. So we are we are trying to recover. Uh, uh, this uh, constraint, okay? So from ear to ear, it's just the, uh, the, the representation from clauses to cardinality constraints. And so now we're going to sum them up. So we see that uh, the first one appear twice, the second one appear twice, and the third one appear twice. So it gives you this, and here you sum up the threshold, so it's three. And so you divide this by two, you get this one, and which exactly means the same thing, okay? And then, yes? So is this an if and only if, or, I mean? No, so, the, so this, this are if only if, here you imply, okay? So, given, uh, the, given so, that x11 bar can only take on one or zero, does this become an if and only if, or? So, uh, so this and this are exactly the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, so th this one, uh, you, you, can you, you can replace exactly when you are finished, when you have applied all the, so you can remove those clauses and use only that one. It, it will be if only if, because it represents exactly the same thing. You, you, have, to fin you, you have to do all the, uh, the simplification and you can replace, and this is what we do in SAT4J. We recover them and we, uh, replace the clauses by the Kalanity constraints. And if, so this is the simple case. Now, suppose I want to have a, a bit bigger constraint. Yes? From step two to step three. Yes. Uh, this is only one way implication, right? Or so you sum up all of them. Yeah, but. Yeah, it, it's just an application, yes. 
because the, then you, you what the, the power comes by the fact that you divide and you get that one that it, which is not one and a half but which is two and this is how you recover the cardinality constraint yeah but then how can you replace the new recovered with all the cnf constraints with the new recovered cardinality constraint because Be the step two to three was only one way implication yes but you recovered everything by the division that we got here so th this is a tricky part, but this is how it works. And it's something, 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 not really happening there. Yes, yes. So the, the, the non-trivial things happening here is that, so th this is uh, the fact that you divide. So here you divide by the, uh, the same, exact, exact same coefficient. And here you are going to get rid of some solutions because you are not having 1.5, but we are getting 2. And this is uh, the crucial part. The crucial part is here. It works because it's integers. Yes. So Daniel, I'm getting confused from two. Uh, so I agree with the division, but yes, um, from the you know uh, cardinality constraint over two variables to getting to the one over three variables, that is not both way implication, right? I mean, yeah. So these only yeah. imply. Oh, yes, yes. Not both way implication, right? No, because see, this is just an implication, yes. So then how can you replace the something you derived with the original set of constraints? Because the, 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 all those, the, the three ones, if yeah. you take the set of the three, then you, what you get is ah, the set of, of the three. three. So you, you need to do exactly those, if you do exactly those steps, at the end what you get is exactly uh, something. So, so if you miss one, it doesn't work. So the, the, you are not applying uh, preserving equivalence preserving transformation at each step, but the whole steps, the three steps, if you apply them, they are equivalent preserving. So the, which is uh, sort of tricky, right? And if you want to do that for a bigger constraint, typically what you have to do is to, you, so you start with greater or equal to one, then you generate all the one greater to equal to two, you sum them up, and then you can retrieve the greater and to, uh, equals to three, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you see, this is a very uh, specific way, and you have to apply that if you want to recover the cardinality constraint from uh, the CNF if the uh, encoding is the trivial encoding with uh, binary pairs, uh, with pairs of uh, uh, negative literals. Okay, it only works in that case. So you see. So this is the, uh, why people are excited about cutting planes, about the fact that you can retrieve uh, all this, and it gives you very short proof for the researchers on seats problem. Okay? So the... Uh, so Daniel... Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, are you saying that I have to go, I have to first combine these so two you variable you things into three variable things and... So you have, that, you have first to, to, to take the clauses, to, this gives you just by uh, yes. rewriting uh, yes. greater than one. If you sum them up, you can, d depending on the way you sum them up, you, you are going to retrieve those four uh, cardinality constraints. So typically, you are, you are summing up three by three all the, those, uh, uh, those clauses to retrieve this. Yeah, so what I'm wondering is, I mean, there are six of there are six two variable constraints, right? Yes, so you, you have to add those ones, those ones. So, so there you, you have be you six choose two ways of. So um, may, uh, maybe I, I missed some of them. Uh, let me check. Uh, because they, they only appear. Uh, so here we are in. Uh, we are recovering for the seeds. No, I think. Because you have. Uh, you have one. You, you have one, two, three, four. It's because we have uh, uh, we have four here, so it should be uh, it should it, it's for, it's necessarily that one. Okay, so maybe so I should. Uh, so, yeah. for example, the yes. first three variable constraint. Yeah, the the three variable constraint. The, the first first yes. one. So, yes. So how was that obtained by adding which two? Uh, one. So one one, two one. So this one, this one. And uh, three, uh, 
So, X1 so, so there, there should be there should be another one. Uh, no, uh, I probably missed uh, some uh, some clauses because so the first hmm? column and, and the two elements from the first row. So these three, if you add, that simplifies the uh, Oh, uh, one, two, uh, one, three. Yes. So th those are the three. Yes. Yes. Those are the three. So yeah. So, so two two x one one two x two uh, one. 2x31 uh, greater or equals uh, 3. Greater or equals 3, but, uh, but, but, but then you divide. Previous line, yes, so it simplifies yes. So it's, uh, that's because you know the problem and you, you do it by, uh, by seats or by, uh, uh, or by researcher. So that's the reason why I tell you, you, you do not do it, uh, you, you, you are driven by the fact that you know exactly what you want to achieve. You want to retrieve exactly those cardinality constraints, so you are you you know because you know the, the variables, you know which one you sum up. So typically, if I want to retrieve that, I, I'm summing up all the the previous constraints with those guys, and I will get them. So typically here, I, I just so typically here I have all the four variables, my, uh, but four. Here I have all the, the, those guys but three, all the guys but two, all the guys but one. So that's the reason why I created that way my example. But it's sort of systematic way of applying the rules to get growing uh, cardinalities. Okay, but this is the way, yes? So can you put the rounding? Uh, does it affect the optimality of the optimization? Yeah, well, this is the, if you do not do that, you, it, it doesn't work. So typically, this is, those are cuts. This is the way you get rid of some part of the search space, and this is one of the very important parts. And uh, the problem that you, you need to be able to use it. To use it, you need to have the, the case where on the left-hand side, you have a common divisor, and you want only to use the rounding on the threshold. And this is uh, sort of complicated to find in uh, real life when you have your constraints. Okay, all the power comes by the fact that you are, if you just divide by your number, it doesn't change at all your, your constraint. You are completely equivalent. You do not gain anything. But if you, uh, if you are able to round up the threshold, then you are removing some part of the solution and then you are getting better. So this is, uh, so cuts, the, 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 the fact is each time you, you add the, those constraints, you sort of uh, remove some part of the search space until you fit exactly what you want. So, so this is how it works. But is it not possible that the optimal solution lies within the space which is greater than 1.5 but less no, than No, 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 no. We, we are in, uh, in the Boolean domain. Uh, so do, do, these are all integers. We, do, do, so this, this is not... Uh, uh, mixed integer programming. This is, we are in a complete discrete uh, space. Else it doesn't work. You are not allowed to do it. You can only do it for integers for booleans. Okay, so th this was the motivation just to show you, okay, th this exists, okay, you, there are researchers, they know how, what is the power of that. And so uh, the thing is, if you look at CDCL, so uh, just when I did my PhD, nobody cared about SAT solvers, okay? Nobody. Because uh, in the 90s, uh, you would use local search to solve problems, and uh, the, the solvers were much less efficient than now. And so when in 2001, we got uh, two of the of magnitude speed up on some problems, I mean, it completely changed the world, okay? Then uh, people couldn't believe it. They had to uh, provide the binary of the solvers to check if it was really not a problem uh, with the table and so on. And then things that you would just dream of, you would write the algorithm on papers, you could implement them. That has been a huge, a huge uh, improvement. Then people said, okay, if we can do a SAT, uh, we can do a much better, right? And then try, can we use something uh, better than just resolution, which is the smallest proof system, simplest proof system from uh, theoretical computer science. And it took, so in 2001, the solver was designed, SHAF, but it took eight years to, be, uh, to agree on the proof system it was using, because to map what was doing the solver with the theory, uh, it took some time. So the previous solvers called, called DPLL, were based on uh, tree resolution. 
And this uh, new kind of solvers, there was one theoretical explanation when it was better. It uh, correspond to general resolution, okay, with this uh, conflict analysis procedure. So the idea is just, okay, so if the super powerful CDCL solvers based on resolution work so well, can we just change the proof system they have in their conflict analysis procedure by something more powerful? And that candidate is uh, cutting planes to be able to do exactly what I showed you before, okay? And so, and, uh, and so the idea, I will show you that actually it's, it's uh, uh, the message is there are things you can do, there are things you cannot do yet. Um, and uh, I will, so the reason why you have an exclamation mark, you, you have a question mark here is uh, there are several definitions of cutting planes. Some of are implemented of solvers, so uh, others are not. And we will see uh, if time permits uh, how we can recover in practice those scalability constraints, but in a way this is compatible with, uh, with solvers. Okay, so uh, let's do some definitions now because I gave you all the, the examples just to try to give you an idea of, okay, w w what is the mind of people when they try to work on this? Um, so now we have that uh, generic definition. So we only saw cardinality constraints uh, in the previous slide. There was no weight uh, in front of the literals on the left-hand side. But the general way to write a sort of a constraint is you have Boolean uh, variables. Here you have an integer. Might be positive or negative. You can uh, rewrite things afterwards. And then you have uh, here K, which is called the threshold. Usually, um, you, so you have that very strange definition of x bar, okay? x bar plus x equals one. So this is, uh, it takes time to uh, have this and to uh, use this, but this is the, the way it works. Uh, and then you can use different way to compare things. And because we're in the integer domain, you can always rewrite with uh, less or equal or greater or equal, okay? So it's, uh, it's not a big deal. And so typically here, you, we have a, a set of uh, pseudo boolean constraints. Actually, if you look at those two, uh, uh, so we have here uh, uh, two different constraints. You see that here you have the negation uh, of the literals here. So if, you had, if I do five on three, uh, eight, and uh, so we have f five, so this is 13. And uh, if you do 13 minus eight, you will get five. Actually, those two constraints are exactly the first one with an equality here. So it's just an equality that has been divided uh, into two constraints. And here you recognize what we have seen earlier, which means a cardinality constraint. We have no weight and we have just a threshold, okay? so. Actually, if you just uh, give, the, uh, so in theory, this is no more complicated than uh, using clauses, okay? This is just NP-complete. Uh, so the, the nice thing is, uh, so those are Boolean uh, formulae, so there is a normal form, so we know that we can translate them into CNF or into DNF or into NNF or whatever normal form. This is just a Boolean function, okay? Now, the size they will take uh, might not be uh, interesting, but uh, the, the point is we know that we can translate any Boolean formula into a normal form. So uh, we have seen that clauses are just a specific case of, uh, uh, of cardinality constraints. So the easiest way to see it is just to take the literals and to sum them up greater or equal to one. But you can also represent them uh, less or equal to the number of literals minus one, and here you negate them. It's just some way to uh, represent things. And so, uh, you, so you can have x1 or x2 or x3, which is typically represented at x1 plus x2 plus x3 greater or equal to one, but this is also x1 bar plus x2 bar plus x3 bar less or equal to two. This, uh, those represent exactly the same thing. So here we have the same thing for, uh, so, uh, uh, so picking two literals out of three uh, is expressed that way, and uh, you have the other things. And what is really 
important is if you have a knapsack constraint, if you need to, uh, uh, if you have a limit on the weight of the element you have to select, this can be represented by one single pseudo-boolean constraint. Or if you know the subset sum problem, uh, this, this is exactly one or two, depending of if you allow or not equality, but uh, this is only one single constraint in uh, P, the PB uh, formalism. So uh, now we can take any cardinality cons uh, pseudo constraints and re rewrite it in a way that is uh, normalized if you want to use it in a solver. Typically, it will be uh, positive integers, positive coefficients, and greater or equal to something. So I take this arbitrary pseudo boolean constraint. So now I'm going to negate it to get rid of this less or equal to by a greater or equal to, okay? So I just negate here uh, all the signs as usual. And now I, I need to get rid of this uh, coefficient. So I'm going to replace uh, x2 by one my x, uh, x2 bar. So, and same thing for uh, x4. That way, I'm getting here uh, four x2 bar, uh, here uh, x bar, but now I got uh, four and a one here that I need to add, and I get this pseudo constraint. So it means that w I can always, when I read a pseudo boolean constraint, uh, reach uh, a form where all the coefficients are positive integers and where here I'm greater or equal to. Um, and so one thing uh, that is useful if we, have, if we look at the uh, previous example is if you have, uh, this is a very important uh, cardinality constraint, the sum of literals is less or equal to one. This is exactly the same thing as the sum of the negative literals is greater or equal to the number of literals minus one. So here we have five literals, so greater or equal to four. And so this is the kind of gymnastic you need to have when you look at the constraint. So it's a bit uh, complicated, but after, after a while you, you, you see it. So uh, yes. are, are you saying that on the right hand side we should always have a positive constant? Uh, not necessarily. You, uh, this might not be uh, positive. There are some cases you, you will see where it can be negative. So you, because sometimes we will have... Uh, uh, so. Uh, at, at some point, uh, once you are normalized, it will be greater or equal to zero. Because, so typically when you are, so we will model uh, this afternoon some problems and we will enter a non-normalized form. So the, we, we, and we use non-normalized form when we model problems. But in the solver, uh, it, since all the coefficients here are positive, it's necessarily uh, uh, greater or equal to zero here. Else, uh, you, uh, it's a tautology. Okay, because everything falsified would be uh, greater than uh, minus one, so this, that would be tautology. What you're saying is that if you do get a negative number, you can make it greater than or equal to zero. Yes, yeah, so t typically w w what we read, when we read the problems, we read an unnormalized uh, form that we normalized, and if we using a normalized form, we, we get a negative number. It means that it's a tautology. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, there are a few things. So uh, when you look at uh, those constraints, they, are, they, they make you think about uh, what are clauses, and uh, you will see that they are very particular. So if you think about it, if you take a clause or a cardinality constraints, all literals play the same role. Well, I mean equivalent, I mean uh, falsifying x1 or x2 or x3 or any two of them, uh, there is no difference, they are all symmetric to satisfy the constraint. Correct? If I take a clause, I can satisfy any of the literal, it will satisfy uh, the clause. Now, look at a PB constraints. Actually, x1, if I just, if I just satisfy x1, I satisfy the constraint. If I only satisfy x2, I satisfy the constraint. Now, if I want to satisfy with x3 and x4, I have to satisfy both. So it means that here, x1 and x2 are symmetric, are equivalent. 
uh, equivalent, they play the same role in the satisfiability of the constraint. And so the same thing for x3 or x4. What does it mean? It means that the coefficient is a way to partition literals into equivalent meaning. And it's more complicated than that because then yeah, there are some subtle uh, cases. The, uh, even if you have uh, different weight, you, you are playing actually the same role depending because of compensation effects and so on. So, those are, so this is the first difference in a clause. You can watch, for instance, whatever uh, literal. They are all the same. You can do that also for kinetic constraints. This is no longer the case with pseudo-brain constraints. They are not all equivalent. Uh, another thing that is funny. Uh, how do you propagate a truth value in a clause when all but one literals are falsified, which is actually when you have a unit clause when you simplify it? Okay, and you can only satisfy one, you, you can only propagate one value, okay? If you take a cadenity constraint, typically what you are going to uh, propagate, it's k literals where you, uh, all the, uh, if you have, uh, if, so it would be x1 plus x2 uh, plus x4 greater or equal to k. So here, you have no more, uh, no other chance to satisfy the the, the cardinality constraint to propagate all of them. Okay. Uh, this happens when you falsified n minus k uh, literal in uh, in your cardinality constraint. But so you satisfy, you propagate once, but k literals. Now, if you are in a, the case of a pseudo constraints, uh, here, for instance you need to uh, uh, satisfy uh, your constraint with nine. In that case, you know that you are going to propagate uh, those two. Why? Because if you, if, you re if you falsify x1, you only have seven remaining, no way to satisfy uh, your threshold. So those two, x1 and x2, have to be propagated. And here, you still have one of them to satisfy, that will, you will satisfy in the future when uh, two of them will be falsified. So it means that you are going to satisfy, to propagate between one and several uh, uh, values with uh, uh, the same uh, pseudo constraints constraint. And several times uh, in your search space when you explore uh, your search space. So this is completely different from uh, a clause. So, uh, and uh, this is similar to what we have seen uh, in the previous slide. If you look at uh, this pseudo boolean constraint, so here you have 10. If you falsify it, you have only 11 remaining, so you know that you require x1 to be true. Uh, if this one is true, uh, how, do, how can you achieve uh, uh, 5? Uh, uh, yes, and I think actually this is the, uh, I should have removed that one because this is, uh, this is not, well, this is not completely correct because this, what is correct is x1 and this because you can uh, satisfy x2 and x3 and you satisfy 15. So uh, it's not uh, as simple as that. But actually the 10x1, the fact that x1 has to be propagated to satisfy uh, uh, this constraint is the same thing as x1 and uh, 4x2 plus 4x3 plus uh, x4 plus x5 plus x6 greater or equal to 5. Yes, I need to, to fix it. Uh, and for the, the last thing, uh, and in that case, uh, it, should be, uh, it should be okay, yes. Uh, so we have here, greater or equal to 14, so same thing. If we falsify this one, we have only 11, so we cannot satisfy. This has to be propagated. Now, um, how can we get uh, 14? We can get 14 by satisfying that one or by satisfying that one, but if I falsify both, uh, there is uh, no chance to satisfy the constraint with uh, any of those literals. So you can actually completely remove those three retails. So this formula is equivalent to that one, okay? But so this is very tricky because we will see 
Currently, one of the reasons uh, the solvers are not working well is because they are producing constraints with those irrelevant literals. And it's not possible to produce them with cardinality constraints or with clauses. This is, this is something completely specific to pseudo-Boolean constraints. So, um, okay. So now, can, what can you do with those pseudo-Boolean constraints? So we have seen that we, we, you can just add them. So you just sum up the coefficient for each uh, literal and you sum uh, uh, the threshold. Uh, you can do some uh, linear combination where you are going to multiply the sum elements, uh, each of them. And you can do, so this is the classical division, okay? We just take any number and we do the division here, the same each side. Here, you preserve completely equivalency. You do not gain uh, anything. Uh, yes? So here, you always take the ceiling by k by m. So here, I just divide by a number. Uh, but uh, we will see, it, you, this is just classical mass. You, you do not do anything. It, it won't help you. Uh, no, but if that turns out to be non-integer, then do we always take the ceiling? Or, or because it's a greater yeah, 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 but let, for, for the moment, those are the, the rules you apply in general. You are allowed to use those rules, okay? But so now we, we will see. What, what do we do? So we have this, we have two rules uh, specific when we have integers. So one is a theoretical computer science division. So this is what I, <laughs> okay, because we, I got a good, uh, huge argument with Jakob Notrum about I, I thought in my community they were using cutting planes for something which is not the cutting planes of the uh, theoretical computer science, which is not the cutting planes of the uh, operational research community. Okay, so I gave different names just to make sure. Okay, so I have three different cutting planes. So theoretical computer science division is the one where you always uh, divide by a factor that you have. So this is what we have seen. You, you have a common factor on the left-hand side, and you just use uh, the ceiling here on the right-hand side. And this is how you do the proof for the pigeon hole principle, and this is uh, what they consider at uh, the cutting plane proof system. You need to use that. And it's really, imp if you do not have the ceiling, you are not going to uh, uh, improve, uh, you are not cutting removing any part of the search space when you add your new constraint. So this is really mandatory to have that. Uh, and this is an, the example so typically that we have seen. Uh, you, you, div you have here two as a common factor, you divide by two, and here three uh, over two selling gives you two. Uh, so the, um, what they have uh, typically, so what you, you have in CPLEX when you do a, a bunch and cut, uh, it's typically that you divide and you have the ceiling everywhere. Okay? And this is how you are going to uh, add your new cuts and you are uh, cutting, you have new, some part of your polyhedron until you, you reach uh, your solution. And uh, so what does it mean? It means that you can just uh, divide by the highest co uh, coefficient and at the end you get a close. Okay? So it means that you can always derived a clause from a pseudo constraint. Then I will call that uh, clashing addition. Okay, clashing addition is sort of uh, like resolution. Okay, so you try to make sure you are going to sum up two uh, pseudo constraints where they have opposite uh, literals. Okay. Um, and so th this was uh, done pretty early, okay, Hooker, uh, 88. And so th this has been known for uh, really a, a while, especially in the constraint community, in the operation research community. And uh, this, so this is an example, and uh, this is typically where we have a lot of problems, because now we are going to uh, apply coefficient alpha alpha prime, okay? And so if I take the first one and I multiply it by two, okay? and I take the second one. So what I have is exactly this, so I take this one by two, okay? Uh, I add this one, so I have two times three here, and I have three. 
And so now what I want to, to do is to, I'm going to eliminate those guys, okay? So uh, to eliminate those guys, I have to replace them by uh, two times one minus x1, okay? So two minus two x1, two minus two x2. And so I can get rid of those two, but then I have two remaining, so I have to get rid of four out of uh, nine, so at the end, what I get is 6x3 uh, and 3x4 greater or equal to 5. So now, what is the difference between resolution? The, the thing is, I remove two lit, uh, literals. You can only remove one uh, with the resolution. So uh, the problem is, uh, so this is the tricky part. You are not used to, because you have that coefficient uh, uh, produced by the fact that you uh, resolve on x, okay? And uh, now, if you look at the coefficient at the beginning and the coefficient at the end, you see that typically the coefficient, because you apply uh, uh, a factor and because you sum them up, the coefficient are going to grow, okay? And that will be, that will be a problem. So, uh, the, the, so if you apply this to uh, clauses, okay? You have exactly the resolution. So this was the paper from Hooker. This is a, what he called it, re general res resolution. If you take clauses, it's just resol paper? Uh, the paper from Hooker, 88. So the, the, he, he called it general resolution because if you take clauses, it's just resolution. But then you can do more if you do uh, use it for pseudo constraints. constraints. And uh, so what happens if you have a uh, common literal? This is different from uh, uh, resolution because now uh, instead of merging, uh, if you have uh, x, x2 or x2, it's just x2. Now it's 2x2, okay? So now you have coefficients appearing. And um, if you have more than one variable, okay, this is where you get greater or equal to zero and this will be a tautology, okay? Just like... Uh, in the current resolution. So typically, if you have this normal form where everything is a positive, greater or equal to zero, or a negative number, that will be a tautology. All right, so um, now the, the, the last important uh, uh, rule that we can use, uh, so again, it's, it's just, you just derive, okay? This is, uh, you, this is not if and if. This is just something that you can imply. If you have uh, here uh, a threshold and you have one coefficient that is greater than the threshold, you can just replace it by the threshold, okay? So here we have an example. If I have a says x3 plus 3x4 greater or equal to 5, it is, I can just uh, get rid of that 6 and put a 5 here because it doesn't matter uh, if uh, I just need to uh, satisfy that one and uh, it will be uh, the same. And what does it mean? It means that if you, uh, if you have a one here on the uh, right hand side, then actually uh, you have a close because uh, you, uh, the point here is, and this is what we, we had uh, previously, okay, two and two, because we have a one here, at the end, we get x2 plus x3 plus x4, which is the expected thing with resolution. So we come back. So, but you, you see there are a number of rules you have to know, and you have to check all this each time you do the, uh, the computation of cutting planes. Uh, and there is also one, so we will see that uh, we will lose a lot of invariance uh, in uh, when we do the conflict analysis. And another rule that, we'll be, that we will need is the weakening, which means that we can just take any literal from the constraint and satisfy it and just remove its coefficient from the threshold. So typically here, I consider that x5 is satisfied. So I get rid of, uh, I remove it, and uh, I'm going to remove its, uh, uh, its coefficient from here, and I'm getting a new uh, constraint. Why is it important? Because we will see that sometimes when we do uh, the conflict analysis, so one of the invariant of the conflict analysis on uh, SAT solvers is that each time you do a resolution between a conflict 
uh, a conflicting constraint and a reason, the result is conflicting. This is how it works. This is no longer the case if you apply conflict analysis with those rules. And the weakening will be the only way to uh, reduce uh, the reason until you get uh, a conflict when you apply the, the rules. So those are uh, specific uh, things uh, too. Okay. Uh, and uh, so th this is not really, uh, uh, so this is how you can translate. Uh, uh, yes? So the new constraint that you derive has fewer solutions than the earlier constraint, right? Because you've fixed some variable to a value. The earlier constraint could have had a solution with... Uh, uh, yes. So why is it called weakening? It, is, it looks like it's strengthening. Oh, yeah, well, you know, we have the same problem. Uh, it depends of... Uh, <laughs> it, it's... Uh, 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 if you're restricting the set of solutions, right? Uh, so, we, all solutions of these ones are... So, uh, every solution of the bottom constraint along with x1 is 1 is a solution of the top constraint. Uh, there could be a solution of the top constraint which doesn't have x1 is 1. <coughs> I, I just wanted to make sure I'm getting it right. The terminology is okay. No, but okay. So, the, the, so this, is, this is a logical consequence. This is a logic. Uh, the, the, so no. you, this is you. What you get uh, is so. No, so, no, no. Uh, so you, from that uh, formula, you can produce many uh, of those. So, so is that a logical consequence? Yes, for, for this one, yes. Okay. So, but so, so suppose instead of five x one. Yes. Uh, I had, uh, I don't know, so, so, uh, so, so you mean whenever the top one is satisfied, the bottom one is also satisfied? Yes. yes. Okay, and so the, the, the last thing is, um, if you do not want to use pseudo-blion constraint, okay, uh, and you want just to use cadenity constraint, there are cases to do that, there is a way uh, to uh, translate any pseudo boolean constraint to a weaker uh, constraint. And you, you just look at how many literals you, you need to reach the threshold. Okay, here, if you take the first two, you get eight, which is sufficient to reach the threshold. And you can rewrite uh, from that constraint, you can produce x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 greater or equal to from 2, okay? So here, here you have that complicated formula and you can, you can sort of tell, well, if you pick just two of those guys, uh, it's okay. So it's a, it's a way to, uh, from a pseudo constraint to generate a calinity constraint. So you have all the same literals. Now you have no more uh, coefficients. And here you have just uh, uh, a degree. And so uh, the solvers have been using that. Uh, we will see because it's very costly to maintain uh, in the solver the pseudo boolean constraints. And so they, they were computing everything and at the end just uh, adding the element. So here you, so you need to do it uh, by uh, dec uh, decreasing order, right? So you have to take all the, uh, so you, you need to have that condition that all the coefficients are in decreasing order and uh, you just pick how many coefficients do you need and uh, that will give you the, the right hand side. Okay. Okay, so we have seen that uh, there are actually different cutting planes, so it can be linear combination plus the division uh, from uh, ILP. We can have the addition and the theoretical computer science division, where you have on the left-hand side a common factor and you only use the sailing on the right-hand side. And what we are going, so typically what uh, I use is clashing uh, addition plus uh, the saturation rule. 
Okay, and uh, so this is uh, Hooker generalized resolution, uh, and this is what is exactly uh, works exactly like resolution on CNF, and uh, is uh, better when you use uh, uh, constraints. And so the idea is uh, people willing to uh, integrate cutting planes will just use some of those rules and uh, put them in, uh, in the solver. And this is quite different from, so uh, there, there, is a, there have been a huge amount of research on translating uh, pseudo constraints or kinetic constraints into uh, a CNF, but this is a completely different business, okay? Because it means uh, I reuse directly the SAT solvers and the latest winner of the SAT competition, and I work on the encodings. This is another story. Here we are working on using a different proof system, using a different representation, because we have those uh, pseudo and constraints, okay? Okay, so what are the, yes? So what about the power of these different systems? So they, they are, uh, the, the, only, uh, the only one for which we have, uh, so uh, Jacob Nordstrom has a paper last year about uh, the proof, so typically uh, you, uh, so we would need to use different things, so they are incomparable. Uh, so typically clashing addition uh, uh, plus saturation and uh, addition and TCA division are, are not comparable. You need to use, then you have the theoretical uh, uh, cutting plane, which is uh, where you can use everything. That works well. But then as soon as you use uh, the division or saturation, you, you have some benefits uh, or the others, but uh, none of them is as powerful as general uh, cutting planes. If, if you do division and saturation, then you would get the full power of cutting plane. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. So, because, because they, they, I mean, it's complicated to, um, uh, when you use saturation, so c clashing combination is uh, restricts the way of the application of the addition. Okay, because you only allow the addition when you have clashing. And, and this is not what we have seen, okay? So when we have to use. So the, the problem is what do you use? What, what are the rules to guide uh, the fact that you combine together uh, constraints? And uh, in, the, in the SAT solver, you guide it when you have a conflict by doing reverse resolutions, okay? And uh, how, how do you decide how to combine? So typically the, the issue is that we try to combine in some ways uh, the constraints. It's unlimited. There is no constraints in the general case, but as soon as you try to uh, uh, f sort of uh, derive things, uh, guide things, you, you have problems. Okay, um, so typically uh, what you have seen with the exercise of uh, Mate yesterday uh, with the Kinetic Constraint is what do you need to detect uh, in a SAT solver when you have a, a constraint? You need to detect if it's falsified, you need to detect if it propagates, and you need to detect what is the reason. So when, you, you, when it's falsified, you have to provide a reason why it's falsified, okay? So whatever the, you can build any constraints you want, very sophisticated one in the solver, and typically uh, CDCLT is uh, typically provide, each theory solver is providing for his theory that kind of information to the, to the uh, solver. This is uh, the, the input. So the, any uh, interaction with the solver requires you that, okay? How can we do that? In a, if we think about clauses, uh, a clause is falsified when all the literals are falsified, okay? And it propagates when all but one literals are falsified. And that's the reason why, uh, typically, you only need to check the value of two literals to be able to know whether you are falsified or you are propagating. And this is the two, uh, two literals per clause. So uh, typically, this, so the reason why Schaff was so powerful in 2001 was for three reasons. One was the efficient data structure, because this was nothing to do when you backtrack. And this is a, a very important uh, feature. The second one was, was the heuristic that was cheap, and that was uh, adapting to the problem. And the third one was uh, the conflict analysis procedure uh, that was very efficient. 
and, and it, all those uh, things are uh, um, important together because you, to be able to learn, you need to have those uh, very uh, efficient data structure that doesn't, where you do not pay a huge cost when you learn long clauses, uh, which was the case before, if you do not use those lazy data structure. So it's very important if you want to learn continuously new constraints to have something efficient like uh, those uh, watch literals. So can we do that? So if you think about cardinality constraints, then you, so if you have n literals, k, uh, a threshold of k, then if you falsify n minus k plus one literals, then you falsify the, your constraints. Here, you see that you have unassigned literals, okay? So if you propagate, you need to have exactly n minus k, k literals that are falsified, and you are going to propagate k literals, okay? So here, you need to watch k plus one uh, literals for cardinality constraints. So the greater the k, the more literals you are going to watch, which means the more impact it will have in your propagation, okay? The more literals you watch, the slower will be the propagation, the whole propagation, because each time you assign a value in the SAT solver, it will propagate uh, through the watch literals in each clause. So if you have a super long clause of, of one million uh, literals, you just watch two literals, so that's fine. But if you have uh, grid or equal to 10,000, it means you are going to propagate it to 10,000 uh, potentially uh, to, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, so it, it's likely that uh, when you assign something, it will be on those 2,000 plus one literal, so you will have to manage it. So this is one first thing. So things are going to get worse when we are talking about PB constraints. So now, um, when do we uh, know that we falsify that constraint? So we need to compute, typically, uh, A will be the sum of all the coefficients, okay? And so if we compute something called the slack, so it's the sum of all the coefficients minus the threshold, minus all the weight that you cannot have because you, the literals are falsified. And typically, when that value is less than zero, then you are going to propagate. So for instance, here, I falsified L1 and L2. So the remaining are two plus one plus one. This is five. Five cannot satisfy six. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is an, uh, a falsified PB constraint. And you are going to propagate when that value is exactly zero. So for instance, in that case, uh, L1 is uh, zero, L3 is zero, and we have exactly three plus one plus one plus one, which is six. So in, if L1 and L3 are falsified, then I can propagate all the other ones, okay? And so uh, the thing is, uh, I show you, this is a simple case because all the literals are satisfied, assigned. Uh, the problem is that it may be the case that you are going to propagate the first time, very early in the search tree, and then uh, later and later. So uh, we, we need to, we will have them several times. And typically here, we, if we want to do watch literals, we have to take into account the coefficients. So early in these two papers, there was a description on how you can extend watch literals for PB constraints. So typically you take the maximal coefficient and what you need to watch is the minimal number of literals so that the sum of the watch literals is uh, greater or equal to the threshold plus m. The idea, if you get rid of m, uh, the, then you, you cannot satisfy uh, the, uh, the constraints. So if you look at uh, the, the, that formula, in, you, in the case of cardinality constraints, the maximum value for m, because all the coefficients are equal to one, is one, so the number of uh, watch literals is k plus one, okay? If you take the case of the clause, k equals one, so m plus one, we have two, which is the, the optimal case, okay? So in clauses, you are in the optimal situation where you just need to watch two literals. 
if you are in the case of uh, uh, can, uh, constraints, you may have to watch a lot of them. And it will depend on the value of the coefficient. So th this is uh, an issue. So typically, uh, the number of watch literals will uh, typically uh, move if you want to watch just the, what you, re you need. But, or you watch much more if you want, do not want to make it varying because the, the maximum coefficient will vary when you assign the, the values, okay? Uh, so uh, that's a big, uh, a big issue. And typically for cardinality constraints, you have the problem that the, the bigger uh, the degree, the threshold, the, the bigger the number of watch literals also. So that uh, uh, really something, and it makes a big difference for LPB uh, learning. So if you want, if you derive an LPB, you know that you are going to slow down your sol solver. To give you an idea, in set 4 j is three of those of magnitude slower. So can you do some sort of pre-processing so that you get constraints where you have to watch less number of because if I start with a cardinality constraint and I do a bad encoding and then I use a two yeah. most literal, then... Okay, I, I, I will show you something terrible, okay? Uh, when you do real problems, typically you, you are doing optimization problems and you have... And uh, this value of k is decreasing, okay? I show you that what is the normal form you, we use in the SAT solver. Okay? This is decreasing, so this is just increasing. So when we do the optimization process, while the value of K is decreasing, what we have exactly in the solvers is increasing and it's getting uh, harder and harder to maintain, okay? So we, uh, there are real issues uh, because, so should we have a representation that would be less than uh, the problems that closes are just uh, greater than, right? So it's not, uh, so I told you that you can re replace them. We could use different representation, but yeah. The, so we have different, uh, there are many issues uh, with this. But yes, uh, for instance, uh, when you do uh, translation into, uh, from cardinality constraints to CNF, uh, typically, depending on the value of K, it's less than or greater than just to reduce the, uh, so typically you, you go uh, N uh, uh, over two and uh, you use one of the other representation. Okay, uh, so now the, uh, so this is one first problem. Now we want to have, we need to propagate, to have something similar to unit propagation, okay? How do we decide that? So typically here I cannot use uh, the definition typically of unit clause because in unit clause it's very specific, you have uh, no other choice and it will not be used later, okay? Here I'm going to call it implicative constraints. It means a constraint which propagate at least one truth value to be satisfiable, okay? Um, so typically here, if we look at, uh, we, we will detect that the constraint is implicative if there is a literal, so that if you get rid of this literal, you can no longer uh, satisfy the constraint. So here we have uh, the example, we have to satisfy eight. If I Falsify x1, okay. Here I only have uh, five remaining. No way I can satisfy eight. So I will need to propagate uh, x1. If I propagate x1, now I, I can get rid of it. I have only four here. But if I falsify x2, there is no way with those two guys that I can uh, satisfy four. So I need to propagate it. So here, Typically, we have x1 and x2 that must be uh, falsified, and we still have no idea what happens for uh, uh, x3 or x4, okay? So, uh, typically, in that case, we could have uh, re re rewrite that constraint because this is a propagation at top level, okay? Each time, uh, as soon as you read it, 
you know that you are going to propagate x1, you know that you are going to propagate x2. Okay? So we could just write it x1 and x2 and so this is a close x3 or x4. So I'm a bit confused. Isn't every constraint implicative by definition or can you have constraints that are not implicative? Uh, well, uh, usually you, you, you are, so, it dip, so you always have the problem of, uh, so this is the definition uh, when you consider that you, you are getting rid of the um, falsified literals and you, and you falsify the constraints, okay? Else you have to take care. So here, if, if this is a, the reduced uh, form, there is no uh, assigned literal or anything. Okay. Uh, let's try to do some, uh, uh, to see how it works, and uh, then we will have the coffee break. So, uh, typically, uh, what are the, if we want to derive PB constraints uh, in our solvers, we have to, uh, there must be logical consequence of the, uh, uh, of the original constraints. Uh, they must be falsified at current decision level, and this is, this is by default, what do you get when you do uh, the conflict analysis for, for SAT, but we won't get that. And you, you, it must be assertive at backtrack level. And yes, yeah, but this is typically not the case uh, in uh, LPB. And typically you, you may have to, uh, it may be assertive at several points, and you have to go back to the first point where it becomes assertive. So this is a huge, headache to, to do this. So, how do you compute uh, the backtrack level? So typically, if you do that in a, in a closed, so uh, I'm coming from AI, from much more from logic. For me, the conflict analysis procedure is just, you do the resolution uh, on the propagation, okay? And you stop when you have a syntactic criteria being that you have only one literal remaining at the decision, at the current decision level. And so this is a procedure that is easy to implement. It's just a loop. You do the resolution between the current conflict clause and the reason clause. And you, you see, you just count how many uh, literals are in the current decision level. When, when that number becomes one, you stop. This is first UIP. And you know that there is, in the worst case, the decision uh, uh, literal that uh, satisfies this. So you know that you, this is bounded. Yeah, there is no problem. This is quite easy to implement. Now, um, the problem is uh, here we have this case where you, we have uh, x1, uh, not x2, and not x3, okay? So uh, if we look at uh, this, this is satisfied, so I need to also satisfy, uh, so it means we need, we need two here. Uh, this one are falsified, I only have one literal left, this is falsified. So now, uh, so I took those decisions in this order. If I look at uh, this element, okay, x1, so I can backtrack to this level because, uh, but here in, in that constraint, I should have never satisfied, uh, uh, so uh, x1 is satisfied, so where should I uh, backtrack? Should I backtrack here? Should I backtrack here? Uh, the point is where uh, X3 is necessary here, okay? Because if I falsify it, I have no way to satisfy, I only have four here. So here it's like X1 and 2X2 plus X3 plus X4 greater or equal to two. Uh, so I have two possibilities to satisfy, either here or those two. And it's, um, it's not clear if we have to backtrack here or if we have to backtrack here. Uh, so uh, we can backtrack to uh, x y not x two, and in that case we are going to propagate x three and x four. And uh, so, if this has been a decision, actually we should have uh, uh, backtracked to the decision level zero and to propagate this as uh, directly as a, uh, a propagation. Okay. And this, so if, if I have read that, uh, that uh, uh, LPB constraint directly in the file, I would have done it, okay? But typically here, I may learn something that, allows, that uh, requires me to backtrack to the very first uh, 
level, which is not possible uh, in the sad case because there is a decision. You stop, you know that there, there is at least a decision where you are. You know, so typically you 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 change completely the way you are going to to backtrack. So here you have two possibilities, and actually the correct one is to backtrack to the very first time you you need to propagate. Else you break an important invariant, which is you propagate things as soon as possible. If something must be propagated, then you have to propagate it. So if something can be propagated, you have to propagate. If, you have, if, you, if there is a conflict, you should stop as soon and detect the conflict. Uh, this is a, an invariant that you have in the SAT solver. OK, so uh, well, then it's a bit technical, but typically uh, computing the assertive uh, uh, clause. Uh, so this is the, what, what I show you. you this is just a in syntactic uh, test where you, you do the resolution and you stop when you have only one literal at the current decision level. And uh, if you want to do it for constraints, then you, it's a bit more complicated because you have the falsified constraints. You pick the reason for the current uh, uh, literal, and then you compute uh, the value of alpha to be able to combine them and remove that uh, literal. And then this is something you do not have to do. If, uh, when you combine them, it's not uh, falsified. You need to weaken the reason until you find uh, uh, a combination that uh, uh, becomes falsified. Uh, and actually, it will only happen if you can apply uh, saturation. Okay? If you just weaken, it won't change at all. But if you have to weaken some literals until saturation comes into play and allows you to reduce, uh, typically, your slack. And then you apply, uh, then you apply saturation on the uh, resulting constraints, and then you repeat until you are in a state where you know that you are going to uh, uh, propagate, which is the slack is the slack is zero. Um, and the problem is that you are playing with the numbers, and typically uh, you need to use arbitrary precision arithmetic if you want to apply those rules. So many people didn't want to use uh, arbitrary precision arithmetic, so they sort of detect uh, when the coefficients become too big. I, I do something else, I use KDITs or whatever, but in SAT4J, we decided to use arbitrary, to, to be pure, to just apply the rules as they exist, but it means, so this is another reason why it's slow, because then you have to manage all those uh, numbers and to use all the, uh, uh, those transformation or arbitrary precision arithmetics, which are typically pretty slow uh, in Java. Okay, uh, I have, um, I have, so I don't know. I have just uh, one example to show how it works. Uh, it's maybe we should take the coffee uh, before to be able to understand it. So just uh, as you want. So, so one question that I have is that yeah. uh, all of these constraints are having this greater or equals. That side of the inequality, yes. right? I mean, there is another way is the lesser equals what? one yes. can use. So how does it impact? Uh, I mean, well, is one is easier to do than the other? Or? No, but uh, typically I told you all solvers from the 90s used the representation greater or equal because uh, this is the natural way to express clauses into, in this formalism. However, I tell you in real, well, in real life, I mean, when you do optimization, typically uh, you are the other way around. You have less or equal to a bound, and so this, this is painful. Uh, but uh, the problem is all the rules that we have seen here uh, exist uh, greater than or equal to, and uh, so if you have to you have to rethink about everything, and maybe not all the, the so it should be possible to 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 re. Uh, uh, re recreate new rules on the other way around, but uh, all the literature has always been uh, mentioning greater or equal to. Yeah. We, but uh, yes, that, that's a practical issue for solving real problems. Yes. Yeah, so uh, th let's thank Daniel for uh, this session.